wanted to talk to y'all about the sacred scarab today. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to spell this right, but the sacred scarab. Now, this sacred scarab is the dung beetle. The dung beetle. Now, the reason why it was sacred to the Egyptians was because they said the same way that this beetle rolled this ball of dung around was a picture of their God. Interesting, right? So, a picture of their God, Ra, which is the Hebrew word for evil. And they said the same way that this beetle rolled around this ball of dung was what their God did with the sun, Ra. And they said he pushed the sun around the same way this beetle rolled around the stung. Now, this brightness of the sun, I find this concept of dung and the sun as a really great analogy for what the scripture talks about when it says, See, it's the man righteous in his own eyes. There's more hope for a fool than for him. So if you'll open with me to Philippians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1. So we're going to talk about this concept of dung and how people think that their own filth and poop is what is good. They think it's, they roll it around in front of them. And Paul's going to talk about this concept here. And it's by way of analogy. He doesn't actually say this about the sacred scarab, but this is a great analogy. Beginning in verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Not in yourself, not in man, not in their institutions. In the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now, calling someone a dog doesn't seem very nice, does it? Well, he's not trying to be nice. He's telling you the truth. Beware of dogs. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. Worshiping God in the Spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Dung. And that's what people want to shine, right? Look at me. Look how. Look at these great, gorgeous clothes I'm wearing, and look at this ring I have on, and look at me shine. And James says, "Don't be partial to a man because he's wearing the gay clothing, or he's." wearing goodly apparel, or has on a ring, don't give him the chief seat. And that's what it says in Matthew 23. It says they desire the uppermost rooms at feast in the chief seats in the synagogues. And they broaden the borders of their garments, and they enlarge their phylacteries, so they look good for men. They want to shine with their flesh. Well, look what, look what Paul goes on to say here. He says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He's saying, I have the right to be confident in the flesh, but that's not what we're supposed to be doing. So in verse 5, he says, circumcise the eighth day. He was proselyte. Jesus said that the Pharisees compassed sea and land about to make one proselyte. And when he is made, he's twofold the child of hell. So, he, he's telling you, I'm proselyte. Circumcision was part of their proselyte process. Of the stock of Israel, I, I'm an Israelite, he's saying. Of the tribe of Benjamin, now he's given his genealogy. Like he tells you in scripture, beware of these vain genealogies. Like, oh, well I'm kin to... Like the, the Sadducees said they were from the priest Zadok. So the, I'm kin to Zadok, right? So he's showing you if he wanted the glory, he has all these reasons to glory. 
an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. So he was indoctrinated. He was in the he was on the inside club. He had his degree for, of being a Pharisee. He was he knew the law. He was the best of the best, Hebrew of the Hebrew, right? Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, the the gatherings, he was breaking them up, right? He was killing them. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. No one could blame him. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Gain. It's like if you have a nice big house and a nice big car and you have fancy clothing. He's saying, I count those things as loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So dung, that's why we, we looked at this here, because that's what he's saying. All of these fancy things that these men roll before him, like the scarab, is dumb. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. So what happens is men roll this ball of dung before them and we can call that the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And how do these how do these college graduates like the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and how do these rulers or kings or nobles you choose what you want to call them and these are the same people who are called giants in Genesis chapter 6 4 and that will come as a surprise to some of you because y'all have been taught that this has to do with some ridiculous old wives tale about the, the fallen angels. Now there are fallen angels, but Genesis 6-4, the way that this relates to the fact that those fallen angels are a reality is that they are always connected to pride isn't that what this ball of dung is that they roll before them? And, and this is sacred, right? This is sacred to the Egyptians, the, the ancient Egyptians, this sacred scarab. And where's this sacred scarab, this dung beetle, going to lay his egg? Right in the middle, right? He's going to lay it right in here. Now what do you suppose he's going to do when he hatches out of this egg that this dung beetle lays here? He's going to use this and he's going to eat this, right? Isn't this what these people who graduate these colleges and these rulers who gain these inheritance, don't they leave them as monuments for their sons? Yes. Yes. So just like the scarab eats his way out and eats this dung, that's exactly what's going to happen when these People who have made a name for themselves leave their substance to their children. They're going to be, they're going to learn how to take all that stuff in, right? And then they're going to roll that around with them the rest of their life until they lay their egg in that pile of dung. And then they're going to feed that to their children, right? They're going to feed their inheritance of these houses, these cars, these nice dress. So being prideful and being wise in your own conceit, ruling for yourself, going and getting a degree from this education is leaven. And the scripture also calls this, you got to think of synonyms, right? This leaven can also be called puffed up. These things make you puffed up. 
So, if we, if you look with me, it might take me a moment to find it in Genesis, and then chapter five, I, I, or actually chapter four. So, if you look in chapter four, it will tell you that. And Cain knew, or in, chap, in Genesis chapter 4, verse, one moment, I had it and I lost it, verse 17. Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So, Cain built a city and called it after his son, Enoch. So, the resurrection of this city building concept and turning these things into monument and leaving them to your, their sons can also be seen because after God destroyed the world, you see in Genesis chapter 11 that they resurrect this city building. So if you'll open to Genesis chapter 11, we just looked at Genesis chapter 4. Let me get that verse again. I believe it was verse 16. So verse 16 and 17. Because there's another important fact there. That word in verse 16, nod, Genesis 4, 16, that word nod, means wonderer, or wondering. And in the New Testament, the word that is synonymous with that is planeo, and that's where we get our word planet. And planet means a wonderer. Like when the scripture talks about wondering stars, it's planeo aster. And aster is the word for star, like we have the word asterisk, or we have the word, the word Easter comes from that word, that same concept, the star or shining. So, wandering stars. And that's what Cain is a picture of. And that's why they, when they build their monuments, they build them around astrological observant, observances. So, we'll put astronomy. And there's that word aster again, right? Stars, planets. And that's why in Genesis chapter 11, when they resurrect the city building again, they say, go to, in verse 3, so Genesis 11 verse 3, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. They And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered or brought upon the face of the whole earth. So when they say, Let us make us a name, they actually say, Let us make us a shin. And so, make us a name is the same as saying, Pride or wise in your own conceits. And that's why we brought up this concept of college. And this concept of king or ruler. So if you look in Genesis chapter 6, we, we just looked at Genesis chapter 11. But now if you look in Genesis chapter 6, in verse 4 it says there were Nephilim. And Nephilim means noble, noble or skillful. Isn't that why people go to college? And isn't that how people rule the world? Is by keeping back the secrets of how to rule or the, the secrets that they teach you in college? Well, honestly, you don't need that. You just need someone to train you or be willing to train you. But you have a lot of people who want to make money. College is a business, just like church is a business, just like schools are businesses. And it's a way of assimilating capital or assembling capital 
And that's what the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, the love of money is the root of all evil. There, um, 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. It says, while some coveted after, they pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So, we're talking about here, we're talking about the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and the leaven of Herod. And it tells you that the leaven is doctrine, false doctrine. The leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees is doctrine. And then the other form of leaven is called hypocrisy. And that word hypocrisy comes from hupo and krite, and it means an underjudge. So this doctrine being instruction, when you judge, you instruct someone. So these colleges and these kings, don't they instruct people? Don't they act as judges? Well, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 12 and 17, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 12 and 17, it says that choosing yourself a king was wicked. And Yahweh sent a sign from heaven of thunder and rain to show them that it was wicked. And then in Hosea chapter 13, verses 9 through 11, Yahweh says, where are these nobles and these princes, these skillful men, you know, and that you chose for yourself, these rulers that you chose to judge and to give you their doctrine. That's the concept that's being portrayed there. And he says, Yahweh says, I will be your king. I will be your king, Yahweh says. So these men, they build these towers and they they pattern them after astrological observances or astronomy, just like they find in the, Meso the Mesopotamia, which means between the rivers, the Nile and the, U U the Euphrates, which is where Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and that's where Assyria was from around that same region. And Assyria carries away northern Israel because of their apostasy in 722 B.C. And then Babylon comes in 586 B.C. and carries away southern Israel. And the reason why is the same concept here in Genesis chapter 6 when it says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men. It says they became mighty men. And then it says, men, let me see, it says that they, men of renown, in verse 4, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Now that word renown, again, is shin, and it means of name. And then that mighty man, strong man, right? Noble men, educated men, those are the mighty men we see today. It says, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So, of old, you can imagine kind of like a legend or a, or a fable or a myth, like these legends we have of Hercules and, and maybe Achilles and these different fables like that, men of renown, even whether they existed or not, isn't what the point here, but that word giants is actually referring to Orion. And this concept of Orion, when he leaves during the summer, he goes, they thought that he went down into hell during the winter to rescue the woman, which represented the crops. And that's the same stories you find in stories like Achilles or Hercules. And that was just the same gods of, the, the, of Babylon there in the Mesopotamia. And so what, what we're getting at here is that 
they the same thing with the that sacred scarab, the way that they roll that ball of dung, that's what they do. They have all of these lies. They use their clothing. And this ball of dung, remember, it represented the sun. So they said it was the way sun god had, had his son, and his name was Ra, and that's the word in the Hebrew for evil or calamity. So they take this dung of fancy clothing or of wanting to rule, and they have these flattering titles and degrees, and they think that makes them shine. But as we saw in Philippians 3, it's just dung. It's just dung. So, along with this concept of mighty man here in Genesis chapter 6, and men of renown of making a name, that's what it says in Genesis 11. They built the city, and they said, let us make us a name. And we can see how that connects with Genesis chapter 4, when it says Cain built the city and called it after his son's name. Again, like we said, the scarab lays his egg right here, right? In this pile of dung. And then he eats his way out. Well, that's the same picture as the way that these Cain builds the city for his son and gives it to his son. And then indoctrinates him in the doctrine and in the hypocrisy to judge for himself over this new system that they create. And that's what's contained in the word world oftentimes in the scripture is the arrangement of mankind. Oh, I've accidentally made that D into a G. So, arrangement of mankind. It's wicked. They make these governments, these Businesses, these schools, these churches, they leave them to their children. That's exactly what it says that Cain did. And that's exactly what you find today. People leave their businesses, their governments, their churches, their schools to their children. And that's how, that's how they climb the ladder of success, right? Isn't that how you climb the ladder of success? You have to be born into nobility. You're, you're, that's what happened with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the rulers. Now, if you could raise a force strong enough to take over somebody's principality, like it talks about in Niccolo Machiavelli, or it talks about in Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, you can, you can take over a principality, but it's going to be hard to hold it if it's been around for a long time, because they've already grown accustomed to their own family, and that's what happens. People with these businesses, when they change over, they leave it to their sons. And they might go to college to get a degree, but that's just, that's just formalities for them. They were already going to get the business. So, what we find in all through Scripture, like we said in Genesis 4, Genesis 6, Genesis 11, they make their own doctrine. And that's why the Scripture says that the, the sons of God married the daughters of men. And if you pay attention to what's being said there, it's just saying during the same time as these tyrants, the, the Nephilim. It's not saying that, it doesn't even say anything about the sons of God and the daughters of men producing the Nephilim. It just says that they were there in the same time frame. Like, so if you construct a timeline, the Nephilim were there, and so were the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. And... The picture there, if you understand where I'm going, is that the daughters of men, the scriptures call, call Eve there in Genesis chapter 3, the mother of all the living. 
And if you look in Revelations, it calls Babylon the mother of all harlotry, which means idolatry, and abominations of the earth. So, in Revelations chapter 17, verse 5, Revelation 17, verse 5, It says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So Babylon invented the system of idolatry, of harlots and abominations of the earth. And that's why in Egypt, you find that same astrological system, just like the ziggurats and the astronomers, they were look they looked to the stars and they said that the stars were determining their fortune and their fate. And so this whole concept of shining of shining and this concept of worth, self worth, is what the scriptures call it a demon. So you can go ahead and connect Diabolos, which is one word for devil, and then Deamon, which is another word for devil. In the scripture, it's usually devils. And the shining and worth, and even the way that these institutions that men, men create, like we're, we're talking about here, government, school, business, church, to wrap in the money to themselves. They wrap it into themselves. And it says Babylon created all that. And, and if you research Ham, and this is in the Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, he explains how Ham, the worship of Ham, just became a secret under the word her. Because the, the Egyptian connection, her, would be the Egyptian way to say Ham. And it means burnt. And her, if you put me's on the end, it means to draw forth. Me's, M-S, or M-E-S, means to draw forth. So her me's means to be drawn forth from the sun, the burnt, right? The burnt, or the burning one. And the sun was the burning one. And isn't that what we're talking about here? The way men want to shine, and they put their accolades forth. As a way to show off. It's like rolling the pile of dung before you. Like the sacred scarab to the Egyptians. And then so. This system has passed all the way down to now. Because it goes from Babylon. Persia. Greece. Rome. And then it. The deadly. The head received this deadly wound. Of, of the beast system, which is the woman who was on the, the seven-headed beast. And that's like a picture of a hydra, right? The serpent. And that's what we're talking about here is the serpent doctrine and the serpent shining. It's the same concept as like Venus or Lucifer is the shining one. Where the true person, the true shining one is God, right? So just like it said that they... It said that there were mighty men in the earth, men of renown. If you look at Jeremiah 9, verse 23. If you open to Jeremiah 9, verse 23. He says, Thus saith Yahweh, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth, glorieth in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am Yahweh, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith Yahweh. So loving kindness, judgment, righteousness, that's what God delights in. That's what Yahweh delights in. So we just read Jeremiah 9, 23. 
23. Don't the scriptures say, Trust in the Lord and lean not on thine own understanding? They do. Look in Isaiah, look in Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26. I went the wrong way. Isaiah 26. Verse 3. Isaiah 26, verse 3, he says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in Yahweh forever, for, for Yahweh is everlasting strength. I'm not sure why they put it twice there. I would have to look in the... the actual interlinear Bible to see why they put it twice. So trust ye in Yahweh forever, for in Yahweh is everlasting strength. So trust in Him. Doesn't, doesn't the scripture say, trust in the Lord and lean not on thine own understanding? I can't, I can't remember where that's actually at. Okay, I found it. In, in Proverbs 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in Yahweh with all thine, all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear Yahweh, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honor Yahweh with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So, what happens is, as we said, the scare of rolling this ball of dung around, and then people think that this shines, and it's their evil, they have their evil before them, and they leave that to their children, if they don't teach them and instruct them in the ways of the Lord, what happens is, the scripture calls this the strong man, and he'll keep his goods, he'll keep his doctrines, he'll keep his degrees, he'll keep his flattering titles, and his power, and his own might, and his own riches, and his own wisdom. Until God comes along and binds the strong man. And just like I had the shirt made in John 2.15, Jesus made a scourge of small cords and drove them all out of the temple. That's what he has to do. He binds the strong man, which like we see is always related to these this concept of your own education, being proud, lifted up by your own doctrine and your own power wanting to rule yourself. God has to bind the strong man and cast out that demon who wants fortunes and to accumulate wealth to himself and throw him out, just like he did to the literal temple. Just like we just read there, your barns being full and your crops increased, well, you can see those are and your press bursting forth with new wine, those are also pictures of, sp of spiritual things. Those are pictures of spiritual things, right? Not just the physical world which God controls, but also the spiritual world that God controls. And I think that's what Christians want. I think Christians want to be able to get rid of these desires of accumulating wealth and just always work, focused on self and focusing on these things that are passing away. It's like it says, beware lest any man spoil you through vain philosophy or um, through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of this world 
not after Christ. These are arrangements of mankind that they make for themselves. They don't, they're not trying to not be wise in their own wisdom or mighty in their own might. Or they're not trying to get rid of those things, of the rich, their own riches. And not, they're not thinking of not trusting in their might, riches, and wisdom. And right here, you have perfect peace when your mind's set on Yahweh. And trust in Yahweh with all, all thine heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. When you do opposite of all these things, of like trusting in Yahweh, you trust in man and the degrees that he can give you, and you trust in his arrangements of nobility and power, and then you start just picking up this ball of dung and rolling it, and you become like them, and then you're going to leave this to your kids. This bankrupt inheritance to your children until... If, if Jesus Christ does, he will. He'll come and bind the strong man and cast out this, these devils from out of your heart and get rid of this, that constant desire to climb the ladder of success. So, alright guys, that's what I wanted to share with y'all for today. And I appreciate y'all watching. So, I hope that y'all go into the world and Preach the gospel. All right. Bye, y'all.